This podcast includes information provided by the issuer and does not express the views of the interviewer. This podcast may also include forward-looking statements by the issuer that involve certain risks and uncertainties to its business. Because forward-looking statements are subject to risks and uncertainties, the issuer's actual results could differ from those indicated in this podcast. Welcome to the Planet Microcap Podcast. I'm your host, Robert Kraft, and thank you all so much for the support and for tuning in to the Planet Microcap Podcast. You can follow the podcast on Twitter at Bobby K. Kraft. That's B-O-B-B-Y-K-K-R-A-F-T. You're listening to Episode 7 of the Planet Microcap Podcast. So before we get started with our next interview on the Planet Microcap Podcast, I hope everyone had a wonderful Labor Day weekend. We published a lot on StockNewsNow.com these past couple of weeks, and we featured articles highlighting video interviews with the following companies. Biomarker Strategies LLC, a private company, GoVX Uranium Inc., GXU on the CSE, Envision Solar International Inc., EVSI on the OTCQB, Solar3D Inc., SLTD on the NASDAQ, as well as an SNN Q&A with Sierra Monitor Corporation, SRMC on the OTCQB. We also published a Wall Street View with Seth Yakutan of Catan Associates that discusses investing in the microcap healthcare sector. I'm also very pleased to announce that we published a new issue of the Microcap Review magazine. You can read the summer fall 2015 issue on stocknewsnow.com. And over the last two weeks, we actually also featured a few of those articles from that issue written by Rick Rule, Alan Brockstein, Carl Douglas, and David Morgan. So for this episode of the Planet Microcap podcast, we're talking about commodities and the futures market. The reason for this is that I wanted to learn more and understand if there is a correlation between commodities with microcap commodity related businesses. You know, whether it's a gold exploration or a production company or even a technology or services company, do commodities and basic materials come into play when you're analyzing these businesses? To help me with this task, I asked Mark Shore, founder of Shore Capital Research, who has over 25 years of investment research, portfolio management, and futures experience. He's also an adjunct professor at DePaul University's Kelstat Graduate School of Business. We also have a very special guest appearance by Shelly Kraft, founder, CEO of SNN Incorporated, and host of the SNN Live video interviews to provide his insight on the topic. The goal for this episode is for us to understand the correlation between commodities, microcap commodities related businesses and ancillary businesses serving or reliant upon commodities. Thank you again for tuning in to episode seven of the Planet Microcap podcast. Please enjoy my interview with Mark Shore and Shelly Kraft. But first, a word from our sponsor. A comprehensive streaming of market data, research, and portfolio management application for you. QuoteStream is a real-time streaming quotes and research system designed for the day trader, retail investor, institutional investor, both new and old, QuoteStream offers low latency, tick by tick data, advanced charting, comprehensive technical analysis, news, and research. With no software to install and no servers to maintain, QuoteStream is the ideal solution for you. Go to stocknewsnow.com and start your free seven day trial. Click the QuoteStream banner in the header or real time quotes in the nav bar to get started building and managing your investments. All right, everybody, welcome back to the Planet Microcap podcast. This is your host, Robert Kraft. Uh, As always, you can call me Bobby. Uh, For today's episode, we're going to be focusing on a sector in the market that's not necessarily correlated with microcaps, but there's an intrinsic relationship, and you'll find out why uh, as we go through our conversation today. I have two guests with us, uh, our first of which is Mr. Mark Shore from Shore Capital Research. Mark, say hello. Hello. Glad to be here. Thank you. And we also have uh, Shelly Kraft, who happens to be the founder and CEO of SNN Incorporated. Shelly, say hello. Thank you, Bobby, for having me on. So as I said in this, in our brief little introduction, uh, we're talking about commodities today, and we're to- talking about commodities futures. Uh, but before I get into that, Mark, can you provide a, a little background on yourself and short capital research? Sure. So I've been in the industry for 
over 25 years, done a, done a little bit of everything in the industry, started on the floor of the Chicago Board of Trade for a little investment boutique called B.F. Hutton. Mm -hmm. um, I uh, have my MBA from the University of Chicago. Mm -hmm. I worked at Morgan Stanley within an internal CTA, Commodity Trading Advisor business unit they had. Initially, I was developing systematic trading models. Um, when I left, I was the COO of the business unit, so I had various um, responsibilities, both operational, I was overseeing the research, I was involved with business development, um, and uh, then I was head of risk for a uh, Swiss-based firm called Octane Research, where we invested in fund to funds. We had about a little over a billion dollars invested. Um, I had dual responsibility, both managing the investments as well as being part of the due diligence team with short capital research. I would write a lot of content, do a lot of research consulting in alternative investments with a major focus on managed futures, global macro. And I'm also an adjunct professor at DePaul University in Chicago, where I teach what might be the only accredited course on managed futures in the country. You forgot the most important credential. You're also the, col the commodity <laughs> corner columnist for the Microcap Review magazine. Sorry about that. No, it's okay. <laughs> no problem. All right. And Shelly. Uh, give a little bit of background uh, about yourself from the perspective of what we're covering today. You know, because normally, you know, you're a co-host like me of all of our video interviews with uh, the micro with microcap companies. But you know, I wanted you to come on for this episode specifically because of one part of your background. Can you explain that? Well, what what I found interesting uh, was when I was at Emanuel and Company. Wall Street. It was a full service brokerage firm. So we had coverage of equities and we had coverage of debt, bonds, and uh, fixed income of all kinds. But the one division that I really had no idea I would ever have any involvement with was our commodities division. So for us, it was amazing because investors could literally have uh, an interest in any one of the three and compare what they were doing within the three. And sometimes we use the research from commodities as an indication of what might happen in the underlying equities and uh, also in debt based on interest rates and futures. So it was my experience that sometimes there were people who didn't invest in all three but utilized some of the information and research available to them from our firm based on what each of the divisions could provide. Right, so you own and operate a commodities trading division at Emanuel. That is correct. In so many words. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, as I said at the beginning, you know, this is a major discussion about commodities from an educational standpoint. And the reason that it's important, and the reason I wanted to talk about it on the podcast, is because, you know, the relationship that we're trying to, to navigate here is that when it comes to microcap stocks and even the greatest stock market at large, you know, you look at commodities as a barometer as to what could be going on, not just in microcaps, but in all stocks. You know, we were talking earlier about, you know, if you're an investor in gold stocks, whether it's an exploration or a production company, you're always looking at the price of gold. You know, you're trying to understand, you know, at what point it's trading at, you know, but the same goes for, let's say, uh, you know, if you're looking at a technology company, you're always looking to see, uh, or maybe not so much technology, but in, in services and in restaurant business, you want to know what the price of meat is, you know, for instance. So from a starting point, uh, can you quickly define what commodities, trading commodities futures is? Like, what, what does that mean? Well, what it means is that you, you have a wide array of, of markets that you can participate in, right? Because you have, you have metals. You, um, both industrial and you know, precious metals. You have energies. Um, you have the grain markets. You have the softs. Softs being it would be coffee, cocoa, sugar, um, cotton, um, orange juice, things like that. Um, so there, there, there's a lot of different markets that you can participate in. Now they all have their own individual characteristics as to how they move. You know they all have their various seasonalities for planting and you know, harvesting and you know, whatever growing. Um, so all that comes into play. And when you start to understand that, it, it makes more sense for those individual markets. Plus then obviously coming back to with the micro caps, how does that play into the micro caps, particularly if it might be an oil company, a gold company, some sort of commodity related business. Mm -hmm. 
So can I can I add something yeah. on that? So <clears throat> where I always found uh, the commodity side of the business to be interesting, I I like to gauge um, you know what some of the commodities were doing and how it affected my indications of what might happen in the price of an underlying company that might have been dependence on one of those commodities. So as you're gathering your due diligence on a company, how could you not take into consideration if they're a large consumer of oil, if they're a producer of gold? You know, you, you, you have to keep it as part of your technical research so that, I mean, look, if you're an international company and you're inter if you're Forex sensitive, uh, you know, your revenues and your profits are gonna be impacted if the dollar is impacted in Japan, for instance. So you, you see the, what I always, I always looked at the interrelationship of the commodities and how even how Forex might have an, an, an impact on the underlying debt of the issuer. And, and also to play off of that too with the Forex, what a lot of people don't necessarily understand is that a lot of commodities are quoted in dollars, right? So if the dollar is rallying, probability is that commodities are falling in price. If, if, if the dollar is falling, there's a probability that commodities will be rallying because it becomes cheaper around the world for everyone else except for us. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's take a step back because, I mean, when it comes to gold and silver and, like, the metals, it, you know, it, it's relatively easy in the sense that you can, you know, you can buy gold and you can get it delivered. You know, you can actually own that piece of, of metal. You know, you can own silver coins, stuff like that. But, you know, from a very, other than those metals specifically, you know, I mean, I guess maybe you could, I don't think you could own like physical platinum and palladium maybe, but you know, when it comes to like, like let's say meats, you know, it's not like back in the 1800s where, you know, okay, I'm gonna trade you my four chickens and I want your meat, you know, and you're saving your meat and you don't have that as an investment, you know, you're, you're, buying, you're taking the meat so that you can cook it and have a meal. You know, but nowadays because, you know, we have mass production of meat, you know, you're able to invest in that commodity. So basically my question is, how actually, how do you actually invest in it? You know, like what, what does that mean? I mean, uh, you know, from what I, you know, I've done a little bit of research, you know, you, you own contracts on it. I mean, how, how does that all work? Yeah, you, if you're going to go long the market, okay, meaning, well, one, you're looking for the price to go higher. Right. Um, most people don't stick around for actual expiration, for the delivery, mm -hmm. for the settlement, right? They get out beforehand. There's something called the first notice day, mm -hmm. which will usually come up prior to expiration of the contract. Mm -hmm. There is usually like several days, there's a period of time when that, before that first notice day hits, mm -hmm. when you see traders starting to roll from the front month into the next month, into the nearby month. So if it's a March, say it's uh March corn, they'll they'll roll into the May or into the July mm -hmm. contract. Um, it's a very very small percentage that actually hold on into delivery, and if it is, it's usually the hedgers mm -hmm. that do that. Shelly, well, you know, I'm not necessarily going to accept a carload of beef, you know, <laughs> but I I think that uh, in in times of interesting. profit and loss in the metals, uh, there have been, you know, the Hunt Brothers, for instance. Uh, well, they were trying to corner the market. They were okay. trying to corner the market in silver. And they and soybeans. And soybeans. And they were taking delivery. And that's probably what broke them. Y yeah, I mean, well, when you get company, or you get individuals trying to, to corner the market, that usually doesn't work out for them. There, There's a history of that going back to... Uh, I know, like, cases going back to the 1880s or so, I think it was someone related to Marshall Field. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the Marshall Field's department store in the 1880s, they, they bid the market up, they were trying to corner it, and I believe the market just collapsed in wheat. Mm -hmm. um, you, you've had a lot of scenarios of people trying to do that, and it just doesn't work out. So, so let me ask you a question. How, if you have, if you're building a portfolio, yeah. and if you're a self-directed investor, um, and you are, you know, younger uh, as opposed to older as an investor. What 
role should commodities play in your investment strategy uh, as compared to, um, you know, let's say what you're owning in micro caps and what you might be owning in high yield bonds uh, as part of your, let's call it your risk portfolio. Okay. So if you take the idea of stocks and bonds being your traditional investments, right? Commodities would then be your part of your alternative space of, of investments. The idea is you're, tr you're looking for diversification, right? If you take all these different components together, at any given time, you've got some making money, some losing money. If you just look at equities and say, okay, I'm going to diversify within there, yeah, you get some that are moving up and down. But ultimately, when you get these larger moves that occur within the markets, equities are probably all going to work together. They're all being correlated and probably heading south. Um, so what can you use in your portfolio to offset that? And then when you look at commodities, you can look at individual commodities and you know how do they play into this? Because they all, all have their own characteristics, their own personality and you know the various seasonalities as to when they move up and down and when you understand that it makes more sense. So you can, you can add it into the portfolio individually as an individual trader and, and try to trade those markets by themselves or you can also look to managers who are trading those markets. So either way, you're, you're adding diversification to your portfolio, you're trying to reduce your correlation risk, you're trying to reduce your tail risk. So is it a long-term or a short-term philosophy when it, investing in commodities? It's, it's long-term in the sense of diversification. Now, to say that you're gonna hold positions for a long period of time, probably not. They may be shorter, they may be days, weeks, months. Um, you know, you're looking for these moves that occur, these trends or these pops in the market. Um, now, some of that comes through technical analysis, some of that comes through fundamental analysis. It depends on, you know, how you want to do it. But just conceptually of diversification of a portfolio, asset allocation, risk management, you should be looking at that long term. So, like, let's say I'm, you know, a belay investor. I, I don't go through a broker. I'm just doing my own investing. You know, how do I actually go out and buy futures? Um, to go into the futures markets, you do it through a broker, through what would be referred as an IV introducing broker or an FCM, futures clearing merchant. Okay. So the FCM, they're the ones that have the memberships to the exchanges, the IVs, then go through the FCMs to clear. Okay. So, like, let's say, you know, let's say I'm managing my own account on a, even just like an online broker deal, you know, a Fidelity or a trade Scott trade whatever so then is there anything even on those online broke on that they offer that you can do or do you always have to go through no uh, no some will have will offer um, commodities some won't so you mm -hmm. have to look at your brokerage firm and see now the other side of that is you could also do like ETFs there are ETFs out there for commodities but once you get into those you have to understand how do those ETFs actually work there are some that um, will not really move in relation to the underlying futures market. Um, and that starts to get into things dealing with how they roll and contango and backwardation, which is a little bit more complicated. But if you're going to do those, and, and so those you could do through you know, an equity broker, right, for ETFs or ETNs. But you need to understand the product just like any other product. So what kind of... Histori and, and Shelly, you can comment, comment on this too. Like Historically, what are some of the indications that you look for when you're assessing you know, whether one commodity or another is going to go up or down? You, know, you, you said briefly about you know, the harvest cycles for you know, wheat and you know, not meats, but wheat and other stuff. Yeah, it can be but, for the meat markets as well. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. So then for the meat markets, yeah. you know, when they're all you know, in heat. I guess right but um <laughs> but you know I, i'm just curious as to you know gold gold and silver you know there's many different things of course but even for all commodities in general what are some of the major indicators that you look for to judge you know what's going to happen month to month well that that gets a little complicated because mm -hmm. it depends on if you're doing fundamentals or technical if you're let's, doing let's do fundamentals okay so fundamentals you really have to look at each market individually okay and Let's say with the grain markets, mm -hmm. um, they tend to plant them in in the spring, 
they grow during the summer, they harvest you know, end of summer, early, early fall. Um, so weather plays into this. So how does that work? You know, are, are, we getting, are we getting enough rain during planting? Are we getting too much rain? I had a client years ago who was a farmer. He was a soybean farmer in Wisconsin, getting a lot of rain that year. I remember him telling me he, plant, he tried to plant three times. Every time he planted, rain came, he got flooded out. And he said, I give up. It's beans in the teens. And this is like when beans were still below like 10 bucks. And he just bought a lot of futures. And they did that summer. They, you know, the beans rallied. Um, but so with some of the markets, it's weather related. Other markets is also dealing with inventory, supply. Also come back to the idea about um, with Forex, how does that play into it? Um, oh, there's inflation. I mean, a lot of well, it, basic it, it, can cre- it can create just, inflation you know, or it can create exactly. deflation as yeah. well. But yes, there's a lot of different things you can look at. There's also, um, if you're looking for some basic information about it too, the government, you know, various departments of the government, energy department for energy, you go to the labor department if you're looking for more about you know, macroeconomic things, a USDA for some of the agricultural markets. Um, you know, they do monthly reports or quarterly reports, and they put out a lot of information. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, on the fundamental side, there's a lot, and you really have to figure out which market are you talking about. Mm-hmm. Yeah, th- the main reason I ask is because it's more of a thought process. It's a, there's a critical thinking aspect to understanding and trading com- commodities futures because there's so many different markets, and you really have to think about all the little things that could affect how you know your the product is being produced and eventually then sold you know so actually Shelly I meant to get your comment on the on that previous question well I, I immediately went to thinking about press releases mm-hmm. and news and um, uh, you know regulatory um, events that take place or don't take place regarding uh, news uh, like for instance, um, you know, you go back to the movie Trading Places, yeah. right? Eddie Murphy, <laughs> frozen concentrated orange juice, <laughs> frozen concentrated orange juice, and you know, you you kind of have this subset of understanding, and then you know, a movie comes along, and you realize that you know, there's really not a lot of regulation as to what can be said about commodities or not, as opposed to like, you know, equities, and it's tied to you know, inside information and. And I wanted to ask you about that. Yeah, there. I mean, there actually is a fair amount of regulation to that. I mean, you have the CFTC, Commodity Futures Trading Commission, and the National Futures Association. Um, if you're an individual, that's one thing. But if you are representing a money management firm or a brokerage firm, there is more regulation as to what you say and disclaimers that you have to put into the information. So at, at this point in the show, I kind of want to do like a... Like an example, you know, uh, using just one market in general, you know, and, and talk specifically as to how, for instance, you would approach that. So let's, you know, you brought up soybeans. You wrote in the last issue in the magazine. You wrote about soybeans. So let's let's say I'm I'm you know Johnny B. Good, lay investor. <laughs> just want you know I, I read your article about soybeans. I learn everything there is to know about soybeans. You know, let's let's go through the process from A to Z. You know, I make my first investment. You know how I would do that. You know, you know what, like for instance, at, at the time that it was written, you would do when you potentially would sell. How that whole process works, and basically, as the beginning investor in commodities, how the heck do I make money? Um, how you make money? Yes. First of all, be very careful, of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, futures have leverage built into them. Mm-hmm. So, you know, in fact, what I tell my students at DePaul is that you have to respect the leverage because that can make a make or break a manager. Mm-hmm. Um, you you don't want to like just if you have you know fifty thousand dollars, you don't want to use all fifty thousand. Mm-hmm. In fact, a lot of professionals, if they have like, say fifty grand, they're probably only going to use maybe ten grand of it. Um, because you always want to be around for tomorrow. You always you know, want to have room for margin for error, right? So um, now the process, yeah, it, once again, it becomes complicated because in the sense of, it, it, let's say you're doing it from a fundamental standpoint, right? You start to understand 
supply, the demand, who the, who, who the traders are, who the players are in this business. Um, you know, you look at weather, how is that playing into this? Um, you know, are, are we heading into a drought? Or are we getting, you know, it, it seems like it's a really good year. Um, what sort of carryover of storage do we have from the previous year? Um, all those things play into it. Now, you, you may want to go long. You may also look at it and go, well, you know, actually, I think the price is going to fall, so I'm going to short it mm -hmm. and buy it back at a lower price. So maybe beans are sitting at, you know, nine, ten bucks a bushel, um, and you're saying, I think it's going to go down to seven bucks. So you, you short it with that idea that, you know, whether it's over a period of a few weeks, a few months, it comes down. Um, but once again, coming back to the fact of risk management having stops or some methodology to say if I'm wrong I pull out and I wait for the next trade mm -hmm. um, I see whether it's equities fixed income commodities people can get married to a position it's the worst thing you can possibly do because it starts going against you and you start thinking you're right and the world is wrong and eventually the world will realize you're right well you know how deep are your pockets until you finally become right if you are right um, so there's there's the fundamental aspects to this right of understanding the analysis of the, of the industry there's also the portfolio side of it the trading side of it um, the risk management and so there's there's a lot of different ways that you can do this so it's it's not it's not simply I do a and then B happens um, it, it's a bit more complicated but Ultimately, you want to understand the market you're in. How often does it move? The kind of volatility. Do you see seasonality that comes in this market at various times of the year? Because that could give you indications as to maybe this time of year it tends to be more volatile. Right now it's not very volatile. So is that an indication of something that's going on in the market? Um, I mean, in the fundamentals of it? Or is that more of um, something that maybe, go, oh, maybe there should be more volatility coming into this market, mm -hmm. and maybe for whatever reason, it's just a little slow this year. Mm -hmm. So there's just, there's a lot. Yeah. I guess maybe the best way to approach it is, like, how about, tell me an example from your experience, you know, when you had, uh, you know, say back in 2005, you know, let's take a, or maybe not 2005, you can pick your own example. Okay. But uh, you know, of a, of a trade, not not just one trade, but just one commodity you were looking at very closely, and you know, maybe we we'll, maybe we should just use like a funny, you know, what's the craziest example you had where you were like either so sure of it or you weren't so sure, and then like it took off, or you know, unexpectedly there was a hurricane and there went all of the of this crop, you know. Okay. Actually, a really good example of this mm -hmm. um, goes back to 2000. This one I was you know, working at Morgan Stanley, mm -hmm. CTA. We traded, you know, systematic trading, so we traded from a technical quantitative standpoint. Mm -hmm. We didn't really look at fundamentals. We may look at fundamentals for our own purposes just to kind of understand things, mm -hmm. but the way the strategy was set up, it was purely quantitative. Mm -hmm. We would get signals. When we got those signals to buy, we would buy. If we got signals to sell, we would sell. We wouldn't second-guess the system. We also had stops in play. Well, in place, we also had profit targets in place. Mm -hmm. So, like if um, it was programmed, yeah, it was all programmed. And um, so, natural gas in 2000, um, it had never gone above. I think what like five, six dollars, mm -hmm. and it was kind of bouncing around throughout the year. And then towards the end of the year. Um, we got a buy signal, and it was starting to move up, I think, towards $6. Mm -hmm. we, we had to take the signal, right? That's what our system tells us to do. Personally, we thought, well, maybe this will push forward. Maybe maybe it'll just kind of, you know, go above 6 bucks and then kind of burn out and come back down. Well, it took off like a rocket, mm -hmm. and basically it went up to about 9 bucks, And we had... When we had our, um, when we put the position on, our profit targets were actually up there around nine dollars, but the market had never seen that level before, mm -hmm. and so that was something that, from a systematic or quantitative standpoint, um, we let the system do what it's been, you know, what it what we're supposed to let it do, you know, all the research, everything we've done over the years, because we don't know where these markets are going to go. It's all based on probability. Mm -hmm. um, 
I can tell you as a systematic trend following trader, generally speaking, they make money about 30 to 40 percent of the time. So that means the other 60 to 70 percent, they're going to lose money. But that means about how do they manage their risk. Um, now, that's for someone that's going to hold positions for maybe a few weeks to a few months. You may have some guys in there who are trading day trading or only holding for a few days. They may have a higher level of, of winning trades, higher percentage. But in either case, you're going to have losers in there, and you have to be able to manage that risk. Mm -hmm. um, but that was a really good example of regardless of what we thought. We didn't think it was going to you know, take off, and this thing just took off like crazy. What about events? when you know you're a long or short position and an event takes place for instance if you're long beef futures and uh there's an announcement cattle cattle right and uh it, it, and uh all of a sudden there's a, a mad cow disease breakout in iowa what happens to the prices of the futures then i mean how do you you know that's not necessarily technical that's pure fun Sure. And that's part of why, like, if you are playing this from a quantitative standpoint, right, you want to have your stops in place. You want to be able to say, look, if I'm wrong, it hits a certain level, I get out. So if you have something that's going to scare the market and, and cause the price to go down, um, then, yeah, then, and if, if, if you're short, that's great. But if you're long, you know, obviously that's going against you. So um, where do you get out? Um, so... Yeah, that kind of question comes up from time to time, but it's always, well, it's not about the events. It's about what we've developed over the years and looking at the research. And there's always events that come up, right? In any given market from time to time, something happens. It may be small events, but every so often you get these big tail events that occur. What do you do? How do you protect the, the portfolio? How do you? Well, so that, yeah. So, I mean, so obviously if you have yeah. stops in place, that's going to help. Um, you know, you bring up another point, and I, I wanted to ask you about it, and I'm sure that Bobby would be interested in this. Um, let's talk about limit ups and limit downs, because mm -hmm. there's a point that you could literally own a commodity, and the market opens and the market closes, and something can open limit up or limit down, and you don't have the ability to buy or sell that commodity. You want to yeah, I actually um, saw that happen in the Treasury bonds, Treasury futures, um, in um, 1987, October 1987. You might remember that day. <laughs> um, I wasn't born yet, but I, I've heard of it. Yeah, it's, you know, it was a, <laughs> little, it was a, it was a little event that occurred. Um, so it was October 19th. <laughs> yeah, on a Monday. <laughs> um, so I was, working in the, I was working in the bond room in, in, at the Chicago Board of Trade, and that day, actually, you know, had equities that were falling. Bonds really weren't being affected at the beginning of the day, and it really wasn't until the night session that you started to see it happen. Mm -hmm. But what happened the rest of the week, it would open up, limit up every, every day, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so there was really no trading. I mean, there might be a, a minute of trading or something, but it would immediately, you know, hit this limit that it could that it's allowed to trade for at the day. What were the limits then? And, and what, are the limits changed today? I mean, um, they, some have changed over the years. Um, you get limits that, um, you know, you have a limit up, right? So it's the most, from the previous, from the previous day's close, what can you move up to? So in, in bonds, it was, you know, it's, uh, three points. So it's, it's $1,000 a point, so that's $3,000 per contract. Mm -hmm. That If you're on the right side of that, that's great. If you're on the wrong side of that, um, per contract, you're losing at least $3,000. Now, the problem is you can't get out of those positions. That's the key. Yeah, and that's... You're stuck. Mm -hmm. You could be limit up for days in a row that you can't trade out of it no matter what. Right? And that's what was happening that week. Right. From Tuesday through Friday, couldn't every day sell. it opened limit up. Couldn't buy, couldn't sell. Hmm. Yeah, you were, I mean, yeah, you were stuck. Um, so the longs, it was great. They were yeah. making money, like, you know, it was like a factory printing money. They were but, happy. But if you were short, you were stuck with these positions, and it got to be a bit of a nightmare. And if you didn't have the capital in your account, whether you had a surplus of cash or not, you faced, uh, well, it happened, where they literally had to, uh, when the market did open, you were liquidated 
uh, and you know you had to come up with the cash or you suffered the consequences. Yeah, you get margin calls. So, um, so is this something that still, of course, happens today? You know, when you're trading. Yeah. You yeah, can, it, you it can. can. It can. Yeah, yeah. You do have. Not all of the futures markets have limits, um, position limits. I'm, I'm sorry, um, price limits, but um, or or position limits, but most of them do. Um, especially if you're looking at, um, well, there, there's another side to it, the position limits, which kind of mm -hmm. comes back to your your story about with cornering the market, right. and you know, how you're you're legally allowed to only own so or possess so many contracts mm. um, within a given market and some people try to corner try to find ways to get more mm. um, but yeah so you've got position limits and then you got price limits so let's this is going to be maybe the most basic question I'm going to ask in this interview and for my audience out there forgive you forgive me if you already know this answer but I'm going to ask it anyway so who determines on a on a because it's it's priced monthly, the futures correct? If I'm if I'm wrong, let me let me finish the second okay. part of the question because I know I I think I'm probably wrong. But um, how how is it priced? How are how are commodities uh, priced on a on a monthly basis? Because you see you see you know gold or a, gold uh, August right. Know? So how. But that's the expiration. Right? It, oh, it's it's okay. going to expire in August. Obviously, it's trading all day long. Right. So literally every second, right. there are quotes, mm -hmm. um, which is great. So it's very liquid. Right. And then you know they settle at the end of the day. That's the closing price. That mm -hmm. and then you go to the next day, and then that, that becomes the previous day's mm -hmm. close. And then does it go higher or lower from there? Mm -hmm. So yeah, when you see that month, that just says the month it's going to expire in. Ah, gotcha. But interestingly, it's a good enough, question. Yeah, because that's how you yeah. see. That's how it shows up on you know Yahoo Finance, and yeah. you know that's that's how you see it. You see, you, know, you see like July gold. corn yeah. or you know December bonds mm -hmm. or whatever. Yeah, it's, just, it's the month it expires in. Okay. But also explain uh, the size of the contracts. Yeah, well, that varies um, by market to market. Um, so, let's see if I can remember all of them. <laughs> But um, there's a quiz at the end of the yeah, year. Yeah, there's a quiz right now. <laughs> um, but um, no, so let, let's say let's go back. Let's go back to the, the grain examples, right? Okay. So um, it's standard is it's it's five thousand bushels per contract, right? Okay. So whether it's corn, wheat, soybeans, um, I think oats is also the same thing. Um, um, let's see, for I can't remember for. The currencies, how they because there's some variation to that, but it just there's a lot of variation that goes into it, so you really have to look at market by market. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you, you go to um, the exchange's website in the U.S., most of that is now the CME group. You go to their website, they'll give you all the breakdowns, all the contract specs, it'll tell you the size of it, the tick mm -hmm. value, um, you know, expiration dates, all that stuff is in there. So that's the CME group.com, yes, okay. So you know, Shelly, hold on real quick. I had a question for you, actually, with regard to commodities and commodities trading. When you were, when you were a broker and you did a deal for, you know, uh, retail, you know, any, any kind of deal, you know, and you had a guy coming in, you know, who, you know, you were taking their order, you, you know, give them a recommendation, you know, how would they approach you when it came to investing in commodities? You know, would they... Just as an example, so that you know, like if we were to go through a broker, like what the proper way in which you would ask a broker to go about making your order for you, you know, like how, how did? Well, uh, <clears throat> I think there's. You don't want to sound silly, you know. You I think on the commodity like, side, you you have more of an educated consumer a lot of the time uh, with people who invest in commodities and trade commodities. They they kind of have a really good understanding of, of the commodity that they're interested in mm -hmm. trading. Whereas, let's let's go down the line, you know, uh, someone who's calling and doing equity transactions, you know, there's, you know, there's thousands of companies, there's thousands of, of sectors of, of different categories, maybe not a thousand, let's say hundreds of sectors that you could look at uh, in, in various different categories of investment equities and then there's the 
micro cap, small cap, mid cap, large cap, so you've got thousands to choose from. Bonds, same thing. Whether they're munis, corpies, you know, high yield, however you want to handle it, there's a lot of jurisdictions, a lot of revenue bonds. I mean, there's a, mm-hmm. a, a lot of different choices. But there aren't a lot of choices in commodities, right? You, you know, you, mm-hmm. we could name all of them in, in a heartbeat. So that's the difference from my understanding. So if someone's looking for a municipal bond, for instance, you have to find out what municipality they want to buy. Kind of makes it simple. In equities, you have to see what their risk formula is, and you know, you have to build a portfolio based on risk management. Same thing in commodities, except generally speaking, I would feel that commodities traders and individuals who invest in commodities have a tendency to know more about what they're trying to do mm-hmm. than equities and bonds. Would you agree? Yeah, I, no, I would definitely agree with that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, and in fact, I mean, going back to the number of futures markets out there, I mean, I don't know, 150, 175 right. markets worldwide, <laughs> something like that, mm-hmm. but not all of them are liquid. If you only focus on the liquid ones, um, you're really talking about 50 to 75 markets. The others, you know, the liquidity, kind of ebbs and flows or it may just be very small. And, and you, you can see that too just by the volume size. And not only that, you, per, you raise another great point, like um, volatility. You know, is vo- if you're a trader, volatility is your friend. Mm-hmm. Because if there's no volatility, nobody makes money. <laughs> and unfortunately, uh, when you have something that expires, you need volatility, no matter how you slice it, because at the end of the day, if it's not trading like a banshee, every day it gets you closer to expiration, and the values decline the closer you get to... Well, it gets closer to the spot price. Right, it gets closer to the spot price. Yeah. So now you're losing your volatility. So let's say you, you buy a... Well, why don't you explain volatility in, in using an example? Okay. So... Um, with volatility, um, there's when you look at it, yeah. I mean, it's the idea is that you're you're looking to make money, and it's mm-hmm. you know whether it's going long, going short, or for hedging purposes too. And mm-hmm. and actually, let let's take a step back because the volatility is actually a really good point regarding why these markets exist to begin with. If you go back to, if you want to use the Chicago Board of Trade as an example, mm-hmm. go back to 1848. Mm-hmm. Um, Prior to the Board of Trade existing, farmers would bring their you know, crops to market, like in Chicago, they would bring it in there, try to sell it at harvest time. They may be able to sell it, may not. There was a lot of price volatility in the cash market. So if they couldn't sell it, some of these guys, they would just, they would dump it in Lake Michigan, they would put it on fire, <laughs> they would just, I mean, they would just get rid of it, right? But there was a lot of price volatility. So a group of farmers and merchants got together, started the Chicago Board of Trade, um, start out just a couple of contracts and then it grew from there and all the exchanges over the years it was all because there's volatility in these markets to begin with if there wasn't why have a futures contract for it so initially it's for hedging purposes and then the speculators come into it secondary um, but that's what's always been about so when an exchange looks to see if there's a reason to have a contract mm-hmm. it's, well does that industry need the contract you know whether it's the grains it's orange juice um, or it's treasury bonds, or you know, the stock indices, whatever it might be, is there um, is there volatility? Because if there's no volatility, why but have also, it? But also, volatility is is a measure of what to invest in, mm-hmm. right? Look at crude oil as an example. Some of the volatility in crude oil. What? I'll, I'll give you an example. I, I'll ask you. What does the change of one dollar in a barrel of oil, too, in the futures market, in terms oh. of volatility, um, one dollar. Yeah, that that can be. Yeah, a, a decent it, size it, move. The, it could be a decent size move. Yeah. So, tr- futures contracts are flipping back and forth, trading like a banshee. When at the end of the day, the producers of oil are only hoping that they've sold enough oil at the price that was higher. So that if it goes down, they've hedged 
what's coming out of the ground. Am I correct? Yeah, I mean, what, what you have is, if you look at the hedgers, well, there's two side sides, the producers mm -hmm. and it's the end users, right? right. So the, the producers want to be able to sell it, lock in their selling price. Um, so ideally, the higher they can get it, the better off they are. The, the buyers, the end users of it, they're looking to you know, also lock in the price so they know, so there's no volatility for them. Um, but obviously, the lower the price, the better it is for them. So you've got two competing interests there. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing you can look at, too, to understand what's going on, like with, with, the, with the hedgers or what's sometimes referred to as the commercials, mm -hmm. you go to the CFTC website, um, and they have the commitment of traders report. Mm -hmm. And what that shows you is who the speculators are, or not who, but the amount of, mm -hmm. of the speculators, the size of contracts they have, um, versus the hedgers or the commercials. And, and then you start to see, well, who are the players in here right now, and how long have these guys been in here? Maybe the hedgers have been in for quite a while. Speculators are just jumping in. It's a good indication. Yeah, it gives you an idea. It's an indicator. To, yeah, as to so, who's doing what in the market. Interestingly markets. enough, Bob, I, I want you to know, I underwrote a company on Wall Street many years ago. It was in the uh, jet fuel services business. And ultimately, uh, the management of the company was trading in futures on jet fuel, and they ended up making more money trading the futures of their commodity that they were selling to the airports than they did selling the fuel to the airports. <laughs> so, you know, it, it turns out that, you know, you can have someone smart in the firm that knows how to trade a future, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a whole established uh, uh, income, revenue stream, rather, for, for an underlying user, that, like you're saying, uh, right? Yeah, so potentially, yeah, I mean, they can use it as, you know, a form of, um, revenue but ideally as a commercial they're trying to hedge their positions in the cash market because mm -hmm. they know they have commitments whether it's a physical commitment it's a cash commitment and they're trying to offset that so actually if they lose in the futures markets it probably means they're making money in the cash market right so it, it becomes a bit of, of an insurance policy so okay so kind of to wrap up a little bit you know because uh, we've covered a lot more I'm gonna have to listen back to this interview a couple <laughs> times just to really take it all in um, but to, to wrap up, you know, I want to, you know, as I said, I've said this a couple times now, you know, I, I listened to this interview, you know, I, I love what you're saying, Mr. Shore, Mr. Kraft, you know, what, what do I do? What's my first step? You know, if I, you know, I have my little portfolio of micro caps, you know, now I want to diversify into some commodities, you know, what's, what's the first thing I should do? Well, what you can do is, I mean, first of all, I, I guess you, best way to learn this is what's most related to you, right? Okay. So it makes more sense to you. Um, if you have some micro cap stocks, are any of them involved in commodities? Mm -hmm. If so, what commodities? Or let's say it might be oil. Mm -hmm. And then you start understanding the oil market. Mm -hmm. And it's not necessarily you're going to trade it, but to understand what's going on in there. Mm -hmm. um, some of the fundamentals. Now, so then also when you are looking at that stock, um, their fundamentals are going to make more sense to you as well. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's really your first approach. Okay, so, so if I may. Yeah, please. I would say from the standpoint of an investor, I would determine how much money they figure they could afford to lose, number one. Number two, I want to go back to my example of looking at equities, debt, and commodities. I think Mark you're absolutely on point about what's familiar to you. But another piece of information in the equities market, even with micro caps, is I want to look at the debt mm -hmm. that that underlying uh, uh, issuer has. Like for instance, how much corporate debt have they issued? Does it trade? At what interest rates? Are they up to date on all of their payments? This criteria, this information is so important to how the equity side of that stock reacts. Because if they miss one underlying payment in any of their debt, you could kiss the equity goodbye. And further to that, the if anything really bad happens in that corporation, the corporate debt is something that they're liable for, whereby 
as, the, as we all saw with General Motors when they obviously took money from the government. The debt was higher up on the food chain. The equity went to zero. So, and that's General Motors, remember? <laughs> Does everybody remember when that happened? Oh yeah. <laughs> and that was really monster, right? So I think it's in the middle of commodities and equities is debt. And I learned a lesson when I first went, uh, uh, when like a couple of years into the business, I, I, as an equity trader and, and, and broker, I didn't know anything about, uh, about debt, probably equity also, <laughs> but I, I knew less about debt. And it wasn't until I learned about the debt that, and then I started to learn about the commodities and I had a basic understanding of when a company was trading equity-wise and I learned a little bit about their underlying debt, which is public information. And then you look at the commodities that they were either buying or selling or using themselves, you really get a firm understanding of what the true picture of that company is. Fair enough. Thank you. So to find out more information about commodities, you know, what, what's a good resource? Like, what do you go to every day and what, what um, do you suggest? Well, like I said, you know, you can go to various government websites to get a lot of fundamental information. You can go to the CME's website, um, cmegroup.com. Um, for the U.S., if, you, you know, if you're doing it outside the U.S., there's other exchanges. Um, those are some of the major ones that um, you're going to get a lot of information. Particularly, you know, it's, it's funny because a lot of people don't really realize how much information the government has on the commodity markets mm -hmm. um, and economic information. And it's all free. I mean, basically, it's being paid it, by your tax is dollars. Is it easy to read? Is it easy to understand? Or do you need to be a PhD? In no, you don't need to be a PhD. Do you need a P PhD in commodities? <laughs> <laughs> but it, no, it, it's relatively <laughs> easy. And if you may, sometimes, like if you're looking at something for the first time, it takes you know, a little bit of a learning curve to get up mm -hmm. there. But once you start to understand it, it it's not complicated. Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, one last thing. Uh, you're going to be in the next issue of the magazine. What are we talking about in the next issue? The next issue will be talking about um, the trends in, in production of U.S. crude oil. Heard that, folks. The trends in the production of U.S. crude oil. All right. Shelley, any last thoughts? Well, I can't wait to read it, and I can't wait to publish it. I, I want to. I want It's great to see you. You know, Same I haven't here. seen you in a while, and uh, I'm, I'm excited to read the article. With that, I'd like to conclude the interview. Mark, thank you again for coming on to the Planet Microcap Podcast. Shelley, thank you very much. Always a pleasure. And uh, this has been your host, Robert Kraft. And uh, there you What's go. What's your website? Oh yeah, oh, Mark. My, I'm sorry. My website. So um, it's <laughs> and your Twitter account. You're an active Twitter user. Yes, um, on Twitter. Yeah, you can follow me, stalk me, whatever. Um, it's uh, at short cap. Um, Say that again. Yeah. At short cap. S H O R E C A P. Um, my website is shorecapmgmt.com. All right. And uh, as always, you can find out more information on us uh, at stocknewsnow.com. Uh, how to subscribe to the podcast. And uh, you can follow us on Twitter at Stock News Now. And uh, thank you again. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Thank you all for tuning in to the Planet Microcap podcast. And thank you, Mark and Shelly, again for coming on to the program. You can access the podcast by going on to stocknewsnow.com under podcast. Go to podbean.com and search Planet Microcap podcast or on iTunes and search Planet Microcap podcast. Stay tuned for the next episode of the Planet Microcap podcast, where we'll have our next week in review, answer a new question from Ask Mr. Wall Street, and have another exciting guest to discuss all things microcap. If you have any questions or comments about the podcast, or you have a question for Ask Mr. Wall Street, please send an email to info at stocknewsnow.com. I'd love to hear from all of you. This podcast has been brought to you by SNN Incorporated, publishers of stocknewsnow.com, the official microcap news source, and the microcap review magazine. I'm your host, Robert Kraft, and thank you again for joining me on the Planet Microcap Podcast. Have a great week, everyone.